Thomas. I am honored to introduce our speaker for the day, Ms. Aditi Vaidya, who is the co-founder of Confluence. Aditi Ma'am is an experienced product management professional with more than 20 years of experience, having worked in industries across India and the Silicon Valley. She has worked in MNCs like Arista Networks, as well as in startups. She has managed large customers, partnerships, product strategy, roadmaps have been areas of her expertise. Ma'am also handles industry and academia relationship as well as market research. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so should we get started? Yes, please. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, thank you for the warm welcome um, and a very good morning to all of you. I'd like to begin by thanking uh, the team at Christ University and the IEEE Pune chapter for organizing this wonderful platform for exchange of ideas. It's a good way for um, academia and research to collaborate, to exchange ideas and come up to speed with what is happening in each of our uh, domains with respect to quantum computing. So today's session, this is the first workshop of the day. Um, today's session is going to be hosted by uh, Biman Chattopadhyay, Gopal Krishnanayak, and myself, Aditi Vaidya. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, a, uh, a bit of introduction to quantum computing and then some uh, aspects, uh, technical aspects, uh, a bit of a deep dive into some important concepts around uh, approaches to quantum computing, right? So I'm going to uh, start by um, introducing um, a very short introduction to who we are and what we do before we dive into what quantum computing is all about. So um, we are uh, all, all three of us, uh, along with uh, this team here, are co-founders at Confluence. Confluence is a company uh, we founded it last year in 2021. And we are on a mission to build a fault tolerant general purpose quantum computer. Uh, we are based out of Bangalore and Pune. And um, in the team of co-founders, we are six of us, um, uh, Biman and Gopal, who are also on the call today, and Ravi and Suja are all uh, experienced entrepreneurs. Their earlier startup was uh, Silicon and Beyond in the domain of high-speed service, and it was later acquired by an MNC. Professor Anil Prabhakar from IIT Madras, um, he's a well-known name in this domain, and he's also part of the founding team. He brings expertise from the experimental uh, quantum technology area. Apart from that, uh, we have a, a team with a theoretical physicist, uh, Dr. Sandeep Goel. His research work is focused on photonic quantum processors. We have uh, Vijay, uh, Gautam, uh, Jayesh, and Dr. Teja as well on the team who are looking at different aspects of building the computer. So that's a little bit about who we are and what we do, right? So now, um, starting from the basics, right? What really is quantum computing? So quantum computing, as we all know, uh, is a completely different paradigm of computing. And it is based on the principles of quantum mechanics, quantum theory. So quantum theory basically explains the nature and behavior of energy and matter at the smallest particle level, that is at the atomic and subatomic level, right? And the unit of computation is called the qubit. Um, it is fundamentally very, very different from a bit. A bit in classical computing today can take on only values of zero or one. The special thing about qubit is it, it uses special properties of quantum mechanics called entanglement and superposition. And that is what makes it so special. It can be in two states, zero and one, at once until measured. What that means is it has access to a continuum of states, uh, unlike the bit. The bit can have access to one state at a time, but a qubit has access to a continuum of states. What it means is any operation you do on the qubit is going to be uh, uh, is going to affect all the encoded states all at once. And what this means is it opens up complex multidimensional computational spaces, which is not possible with today's classical computing, right? And this is what gives quantum computers its power to solve very large complex problems. So, uh, so. 
some of these problems are uh, typically optimization problems, finding the uh, best uh, path for uh, transport or financial portfolio modeling, right? So quantum computers are very good at solving these optimization problems. One very interesting area uh, of impact is um, the RSA encryption. Today, uh, when you uh, do any financial transactions with your bank, you exchange personal information over the internet, or people exchanging military secrets across borders. All that is held together by RSA encryption. That is what protects our data today. And today, no supercomputer can break this encryption in any reasonable amount of time. There's a table here which says it takes million years to uh, break this encryption. But with a quantum computer, that is possible in a matter of a few hundred seconds. So you can imagine the kind of impact it has on the security aspect. There are some other uh, interesting applications as well, right? Um, quantum computers are very good at uh, handling large problems with very large number of variables. So for example, modeling all electrons within a molecule. Uh, it can be done in a much, much better way on a quantum computer. So it helps speed up uh, drug discovery uh, in the domain of pharmaceuticals. It also, um, uh, there are some interesting ways in which some automobile industries today are already using it in, up to some extent. Uh, electric vehicles, for example, one of the important uh, things for them is to make sure that they uh, make the best possible battery for a longer life. And battery technology is very, very complex work. So modeling all the reactions that go on, the chemical reactions that go on inside a battery is extremely complex. And today, these companies do use uh, supercomputers to do that. But even with that, uh, there's a very large amount of time that is required. There's a lot of averaging out of errors. And what all this results in is a much, much longer research cycle. So with quantum computers, this can be cut down uh, in a very large way. They are able to simulate these reactions in a much, much efficient way. So these are some of the applications uh, in, in, uh, and areas in which quantum computers are being used, right? And um, because this is sort of um, uh, newer technology, right? There are ways in which this can be used, which we cannot even imagine right now. I love this quote on the right side, if you see, right? This is from the late 1940s, when the very, one of the very first few computers in, uh, in Britain, uh, this is what the newspaper had to say about it. It says that the computer may one day come down to our level of the common people and help with our income tax and bookkeeping calculations. But this is speculation and there is no sign of it so far. So, and you see how the computer has evolved and how it has gone on to, you know, um, uh, really, really be used in the way personal computers are used. So there's always the possibility of new tech being used in ways that we cannot even think of right now, right? So a little bit about how this technology has evolved over more than 100 years, in fact. So the 1900s, in fact, were um, uh, years of a lot of theory in this domain. Um, and then uh, later in the last few years, a lot of action has happened. So if you look at the timeline here, right, it started with, uh, the famous scientist Max Planck proposing that energy is actually bursts of uh, quanta of energy. Energy is made up of quanta of energy, packets of energy. And that is where uh, scientists started thinking more on these lines. And uh, that led Einstein to come up with the uh, idea of photons. The idea that light, in fact, is made up of individual quantum particles called photons. So that was very early 1900s. And then a lot kept happening. Multiple different scientists were proposing theories here. And um, it was 1924 when Max Born used the term quantum mechanics for the first time. Um, we have all heard of uh, the Schrodinger's cat thought experiment where the poor cat is alive and dead at the same time until observed. So it was 1930s, 1935 to be precise, when Erwin Schrodinger proposed this thought experiment, right? And quantum mechanics proposed some um, interesting concepts of superposition, of entanglement, 
and uh, Einstein very famously wrote about entanglement in a letter to Max Born in 1947, calling it spooky action at a distance. So all this was happening and 1960s, the famous Bell's theorem, Bell's inequality was proposed. So all this was happening and then um, a very interesting milestone came up in 1981 when Richard Feynman in one of his talks proposed that a quantum computer could solve problems much faster than a conventional computing computer. After that, again, um, 90s, 1990s, so between 1992 and 96 is when some of the uh, famous scientists, Deutsche, uh, Peter Shore and Grover proposed their first algorithms for uh, quantum computers. So um, you may have heard of Shor's algorithm famously. Uh, it gives us um, the ability to actually factorize prime numbers. And that is in fact what helps quantum computers break the uh, RSA encryption, right? And Grover had proposed the quantum database search algorithm. So all this was happening and it was almost the end of uh, 1900s, 1998, when the first two qubit quantum computer was built based on the nuclear spin technology at MIT and Los Alamos labs. And then came the last uh, 20 years of a lot of action. A lot of computers being built on different technologies, a lot of startups coming up in this area across the globe, right? So 2007 was when um, the cold atom based company called Cold Quanta was established in, uh, uh, in the US. Uh, immediately followed by a demonstration of uh, first photonic qubits on a chip. D-Wave was one of the first companies to launch their first commercial quantum computer. Uh, they make quantum annealers, in fact. And um, then 2015, 2016 onwards, a lot of startups mushrooming up in this area. Uh, there were companies based on um, uh, creating quantum computers that would use photons of light as the fundamental particles as their qubits, right? So these companies, Psy Quantum and Xanadu were founded in this period of time. And then that was followed by a lot happening in the superconducting uh, world with IBM and Google announcing um, their uh, quantum computers. And then 2019 saw some interesting um, things happening when Google claimed to have reached quantum supremacy. Of course, that claim was uh, later contested by IBM but that was 2019. And then uh, 2020, um, Honeywell, that is, it's now called Quantinium after the merger of two companies, but uh, they established their system model H1, a 10 qubit ion trap quantum computer. So this was yet another approach of towards building qubits, right? Um, then again, IBM was making a lot of progress, a lot was happening. Their latest uh, quantum processor is a 127 qubit uh, quantum processor. And just a few months back, Xanadu, that is another company, it, uh, it makes quantum computers, again, based on the photonics technology. Uh, they use continuous variable paradigm of quantum computing. And they demonstrated, they claimed to have achieved quantum computation advantage with 216 squeeze state qubits. So as you can see, a lot has happened with respect to industry, with respect to actually getting this technology out to market in the last 20 to 22 years. So a lot of action happening and it continues to uh, go on. And then just a few weeks back, exciting news for uh, quantum computing enthusiasts across the world, quantum optics researchers won the Physics Nobel Prize, Alan Aspect, John Clauser and Anton Zellinger. They won the Nobel Prize for their experiments with entangled photons, establishing the violation of Bell inequalities and for all their pioneering work in the field of quantum information science. So a lot has been happening in this area. And uh, like I said, a lot of startups coming in in this domain, right? So now, that was a little bit of history and what is happening right now. But when you look at quantum technologies, it, if you, it can be broadly divided into sort of three sectors, uh, quantum computing, where actual hardware and software for quantum computers is built. We have quantum communications. It, that's the area that deals with the aspect of establishing secure quantum networks. And then there's quantum sensing, 
where sensors are made based on quantum theory. And these sensors are highly sensitive to disturbances around the environment. And that is what makes them great measuring instruments. Right? So now, um, as far as quantum computers go, there are multiple ways in which a quantum computer can be built. So the way a qubit is created is different in each of these approaches. So at a high level, you could divide them into the gate based approach. In this approach, the qubits, um, they are operated upon sequentially and uh, measurements are done at the end. So this is useful for um, uh, approaches such as the superconducting qubits, also known as transmon, uh, famous, uh, I mean, some popular ones are Google, Google and IBM who are following this philosophy. There's uh, these other approaches, ion trap, where ions of specific uh, elements are trapped and manipulated using lasers under high vacuum conditions. And then there is the measurement based quantum computing paradigm. So when uh, photonics is used as a paradigm of uh, computing, right? We saw there are some companies in that domain. Photons of light are particles always in motion and it is not possible to uh, do sequential operations on them. And in fact, some of aspects of this Gopal and Biman will be touching upon in their talks later on. But basically that is where MBQC comes in. It helps to uh, do operations and measurements on particles of light that are always in motion. And again, under that, you have the discrete variable approach, the continuous variable approach. Um, so we saw that Psi Quantum, uh, I mentioned, is a company in this domain, and they follow the discrete variable approach, where the presence or absence of a photon is directly mapped to a qubit. It's also called a dual rail qubit. You may have heard of that term. And then there is the continuous variable paradigm where um, the continuous field of electric field quadrature is mapped to a qubit. So, as you can see, multiple ways a qubit can be built and therefore multiple ways a quantum computer can be built. And each of these approaches have their pros and cons. And this is a more detailed table. Please don't get bogged down by the amount of information on this slide. But this is just to give you an idea of what kind of parameters can be used to compare these different technologies, right? Uh, number of qubits, the qubit volume, so, so quantum volume, so to say. Does it does the technology require cooling? For example, one of the uh, main uh, hurdles in the transmon or superconducting approach is the requirement to cool down the equipment to a few millikelvin, two millikelvin, and that means the use of very very large dilution refrigerators. So those kind of aspects. Photonics, on the other hand, most operation is possible at room temperature. Then is there a requirement of lasers? How about high vacuum? For example, ion trap, ion trap uh, quantum computers require very high vacuum. And uh, all these parameters affect the coherence time of a qubit. So these are all very important parameters. So these are some of the parameters. And just to give you an idea uh, of how com different companies are present in different um, uh, sections of this, uh, this approach, right? We saw that IBM, Google, uh, these are some of the popular ones. They are the superconducting guys. Um, Rigetti uh, is also another company that uses this approach. The Chinese government claims to have built a quantum computer using the superconducting approach as well. Under ion trap, uh, we have Quantinium, previously uh, Honeywell. There's other companies like Oxford Ionix, uh, there's IonQ. Uh, we also saw a company called Cold Quanta at the beginning in the history section. So Cold Quanta follows the cold, uh, cold atom approach. And then um, we have the photonics people where um, Psi Quantum is a company based out of uh, US California. Uh, they make dual rail qubits. Xanadu is a Canada based company and uh, they, their approach towards building uh, qubits is slightly different, but they are also photonics based. And then of course, our own company Confluence, we do this. And these are some of the approaches. There are multiple different ways, but these are some of the more um, popular ones. So, as I said, a lot of different companies coming up in the last few years. These names are just a very, very few in this domain, right? But all these companies are spread out across the globe and um, 
all of them are making their own quantum computers. Um, some of them are making uh, software uh, for uh, the computers. Some of them are full stack quantum computing companies where they're making the hardware and the software to go with it, right? So uh, it's interesting to see that the distribution of these companies across the globe shows that most of these startups are centered in the United States. It has the US today has 60 startups in the domain of quantum computing. And it is followed by Canada. They have about 27. Um, there's a lot of action happening in UK and uh, the European Union as well. China claims to have built two quantum computers and uh, not a lot of information is available, but uh, they do say that there are two quantum computers. They also claim to have built some quantum communication networks for test purposes. So kind of action happening all across the globe and the startups continue to emerge uh, in terms of maximum number of new startups coming up today, European Union and Canada have the most new number of uh, launches happening. And the kind of money that is being pumped in by private sector as well as governments across the world is pretty large. Um, of course, governments want IP in this domain. They want to build their own quantum computers because of the kind of um, impact they have on uh, national security. So as you can see here, um, United States has a lot of private funding pouring into it and um, followed by UK. UK has about $979 million in this industry. Canada follows UK, then there's European Union and China. And in fact, uh, as far as India is concerned, um, uh, there's a good amount of um, uh, money announced in the uh, budget uh, two years back. 8,000 crores was announced for efforts in uh, our own uh, quantum computing uh, research and uh, industry work, right? So we are hoping that that money flows into the right directions and we are also going to sort of compete globally. And we saw that the quantum technology market as such, there are three broad aspects to it. And because US is sort of the hub uh, of uh, this activity right now, um, this, this graph will give you an idea of the kind of money that has gone into different sectors of this uh, technology. So quantum computing um, gets the most amount of funds from the US government. Quantum communications and sensing comparatively are smaller markets. And um, again, like we saw, quantum communications and sensing are evolving markets. A um, lot is happening in both these uh, areas uh, with respect to the equipment and uh, hardware components that they manufacture. So a lot of money is coming in through uh, those areas. And then um, we are optimistic in general uh, the market is slated to grow at a very uh, good rate over the next few years. So uh, that's that's that graph should give you an idea of the kind of uh, money expected to flow into this market over the period of next few years. So this was a brief about um, the kind of, um, uh, you know, what quantum computing is, what applications we foresee, uh, and a bit of an industry view into this domain, right? I'm now going to hand it over to um, Gopal to talk more about um, some of these um, technical aspects of quantum technologies. But before going there, I'm going to leave you all today with some humor for the day because quantum mechanics is uh, a bit crazy. And um, yeah, so I'm going to leave you with this humor for the day. And it was great talking to you all, connecting to you all. Thank you. Um, over to you, Gopal. Thank you, Aditi. Yeah, so I think I need to be made the presenter. Yeah.
Vardhan, can you make Gopal the uh, co-host? He yeah. needs to share his... Yeah. Yeah, so uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I would like to start by thanking uh, Christ University and uh, the IEEE Pune section for organizing organizing this event and uh, also invi inviting us to make this presentation. So Aditi, in her session, uh, gave a high-level overview of the industry and uh, uh, technology. So my session and followed by Bivan session will deep dive more into the, the technology aspect. Okay. So I will uh, cover at a higher level of the various types of uh, quantum computing. Uh, so, so specifically, we will look at the gate-based uh, approach, the quantum annealing approach, and the Gaussian boson sampling uh, approach. Okay, at the end, I will just show a comparison to give a higher level uh, comparison between these three schemes. Okay, so so this slide covers about the gate-based quantum computing. So in this slide, for this approach and for other approach, uh, the the method I will use is uh, I will try to use an example to support my explanation and uh, try to highlight what are the basic uh, quantum mechanical features which are coming into play uh, in in solving the example problem. Okay. So this is a crowded slide, so just have patience, uh, just follow me and, and the mouse pointer. Uh, okay. So the example I have taken for the gate-based quantum computing is uh, the dash the dash Dosa algorithm. Uh, this is actually the first algorithm which was uh, proposed to indicate that uh, quantum computing uh, can solve problems uh, much better than what classical can do. Yeah. So the, this is a problem statement. Uh, it says how to find the type of a function f of x only using the inputs and outputs. So with no prior knowledge of what f of x is, just using the inputs and outputs, what how to find the type of f of x. So I think this table tries to explain the same uh, problem statement. So if, let's say f of x is a function of x, where x can be expanded in binary format, is a cap is a n bit uh, number. Uh, and f of x, let's say, can take only binary values, which is 0 or 1. Uh, and as I said, x, uh, each bit of x is binary, 0 or 1. So this function, uh, let's say, has uh, uh, two types. It could be a constant function or a balanced function. So the meaning of that is defined here. So if f of x is constant, then f of x is either 0 or 1. Right? It should be one of the two. Uh, for all x, so which means f of x is constant. Okay, uh, and if f of x is if f of x is of balanced type, then f of x will be zero for half the values of x. We don't know which ones, and it will be equal to one for the remaining half of the values of x. Okay, so this is the uh, this is the function f of x. So now the problem is. Uh, how do we find whether f of x is of type constant or balanced? Okay, so if we have to do it classically with the 100% certainty in the result, then we need to sweep the values of x and observe the output f of x for at least half plus one number of values. So because even if it, for example, if it was balanced, uh, a hypothetical worst case can be for the first half of the uh, x values that we gave in, it returned a zero. But we are still not sure whether it is a constant type or balanced type, right? So we need to hence give at least half of the values of x plus one, that many count of inputs, input trials we need to do uh, to find whether it's a constant type or balanced type. So this is how, this is what it turns out to be. If we have to do it classically. Okay. But if we try to solve the problem using quantum mechanics, okay, the, the situation becomes much simpler using the quantum mechanical properties of superposition and entanglement. 
So let's look at that, how, how the problem becomes simply solved in quantum mechanics. So this is the figure uh, which, uh, uh, which shows the circuit. So this is the input. Uh, so, and uh, so this input is kept at uh, all zero state. The Hadamard operation in the beginning will convert the zero state into plus state. And as we know, plus is a superposition between zero and one state. Okay. And uh, an ancillary extra input is required called Y. And for that input, we start with one and go to a Hadamard uh, and go into this box. So inside this box is where f of x is uh, uh, hidden, implemented in a hidden way. Okay. And uh, what we are doing here is uh, this output we are modifying as uh, uh, using a modulo 2 addition. So y, so y plus f of x. So f of x I already said is binary. So we can do y plus f of x. So, so let's see with the example uh, how this circuit actually helps us uh, decode uh, uh, and solve this problem. Okay. So, so let's take a case where x uh, is a two-bit input, uh, namely zero zero, and uh, y is in, mentioned in this column. So, at first, I will look at this case two example where f of x is a constant. So, I have illustrated that here with two bits. It's f of zero, one, two, three, all are zero. So it's a it's of a constant value. Okay, and uh, the rows in this table are corresponding to this one, two, three, four points marked in this figure. So, so at point one at the input x is zero zero y is one as you see here. At point two after the Hadamard gate, uh, x becomes plus plus, and y becomes minus because Hadamard of one is a minus. That uh, in an expanded form is uh, is shown here. So it basically covers all the values of x. <laughs> Okay, somebody needs to mute. Yeah, so so as we see here, uh, at this point, we have all the values of x covered in one shot. Okay, whereas y, uh, the minus is shown as zero minus one. So f of x, as we show seen, is is zero for all values. Uh, so hence. Uh, this operation y modular addition to with f of x will just return y. Okay. So hence uh, x does not change at the point 3. Uh, x does not change. It is same as input. And y also does not change because f of x is 0. Right. So, so after that, again, if we put a Hadamard on the x, we just get, get back the original value, which is plus plus. Right, uh, and after that, uh, yeah, sorry, sorry. This this particular thing uh, is plus plus, and after that, if you add, apply Hadamard, then it goes back to zero zero, which is the original input. Okay, so 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 a zero zero coming here uh, indicates a, it's a constant function. Okay, so obviously this still does not tell you how the problem is solved. So that will be more clear when you look at this other example. So let's say this case one example is for a balanced condition. So this is the function shown here. So f of uh, zero is zero. Let's say f of one and f of two are one and f of three is zero. So this is a balanced case. So it's a two-bit input. So half of the values are returning a zero and half of the values are returning a one. Okay. So, so this particular function uh, for implementation using uh, the quantum gates is uh, is is shown here. So this this particular implementation is inside this box. So basically, two CNOT gates are required with the two bits, and this uh, will modify y as y modulo two addition with f of x, where f of x is such a function. Okay. So now let, again, let's walk through at points one, two, three, four. What happens? Uh, one the same. At point two, it is still the same as before. So at point three. Uh, so as shown in this circuit, we, we are just showing x is unchanged, right? So, so looking at simplistically, we would expect at the point 3, x to be unchanged and y, right, to have 
two particular values because f of x is a super superposition of four values and for half of those values we should see x unchanged because f of x is zero and for half of those values we should see x change to uh, cat one minus cat zero because of this modulo to addition where f of x is one right but but why being a single signal how can it have two separate values right so these two values are having two different phases right so so y is in an entangled state with these four values which are in superposition coming from x right but y being a single signal it cannot have these two separate values uh, which are different in phase right so so hence what in reality happens is a phase kickback happens from y to x so hence this is not what happens y remains let's say in 0 minus 1 state but this 1 minus 0 cases give a phase kickback on to x so hence the x that comes out at this point right is 0 0 minus 0 1 minus 1 0 plus 1 1 so these two these two guys are have changed a sign from plus to minus because of the basic kickback coming from y for the cases where f of x was 1 right so that's what happened so now this particular thing simplifies to minus minus and this after the hadamard gate will return a 1 1 okay so this is how the problem is solved so so using a quantum mechanical uh, circuit uh, so we if if the input was constant we always expect to expect to see a 0 0 on the output and if, if the input was balanced we will see a non zero zero output coming out so in this example i have shown one one but based on how you for other types of balanced uh, mapping of this function we will get other non zero values like zero one or one zero okay. so so this is a pretty uh, the most straightforward example which demonstrate how superposition and entanglement are are used uh, to solve a problem uh, quantum mechanically in a much more efficient way compared to classical. Okay. So, so this particular kind of solution where we have used uh, uh, quantum states and quantum gates uh, to do the operation uh, is what is called as gate-based quantum computing. And uh, hardware-wise, uh, the, the most uh, used example is coming from this IBM. So, and there are other players, as Aditi already pointed out, who do the gate-based implementation. Uh, so, so this particular circuit can be implemented on a gate based quantum computer. Okay, so next, uh, uh, let's look at quantum annealing. Uh, so, this is a different kind of uh, paradigm, uh, but still using the quantum mechanical uh, properties. Okay, so again, I will use an example. So, in this case, the example I'm using is a matching problem. So the problem definition is as follows. Uh, so the problem is to identify in a graph uh, the maximum number of uh, edges from a graph with no overlapping vertices between the edges. Uh, so let me explain using this example here. So, so this is a graph with four vertices and uh, six edges. Uh, so we need to identify maximum number of edges uh, with no overlapping vertices. So the valid solutions are, let's say, if we identify E1 and E3, so we have covered all the vertices uh, with no overlap between them. So E1 has this, these two as the vertices and E3 has these two as the vertices. And the other valid solutions are we can pick E2 and E4 or we can pick E5 and E6. So there are three valid solutions for this problem. So, so before I get into quantum mechanics, uh, uh, to, to solve this kind of a problem uh, mathematically, right? So we can uh, uh, write uh, what's called a cubo here, uh, which let's say uh, represents uh, some parameter, let me call it as energy. Okay? Uh, and our goal is to minimize the energy to find the solution. So, so here you see I have written, uh, okay, so the, the e, E1, E2 terms here mean uh, the definition is as, as follows. So if E1 is zero, then uh, uh, edge one is not part of the solution. If E one is one, then edge one is part of the solution, and so on for other E's. 
So the 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 is with the negative terms written here. Uh, uh, it is uh, uh, okay. So our goal is to minimize energy, right? So so which means more negative the energy, then that is uh, taking us towards the solution. So so we want to pick the maximum number of edges. So hence I have written here minus e1 minus e2 minus e3 minus e5 minus e6. So if we pick all the edges, then we have the highest negative term, which is going towards the solution. But uh, but picking all the edges can't be the solution because there is a constraint saying that there should be no overlap between the vertices. Okay. And that is encoded uh, by these positive terms. So because it's a constraint, so it puts a penalty uh, on the energy. So using the plus, right? Uh, and if you see the terms here, uh, for each of the edges, it uh, ends it with the terms of the adjacent edges with the plus factor here. So it's E1 has, for example, E2, E4, E5, E6, E2, E4, E5, E6, which are the adjacent edges for E1. So this plus plus puts a penalty on this. So this particular thing, if you just sweep, so there are six, six uh, uh, edges here. So there are two, four, six, 64 combinations, right? So if you just sweep all the values, this is the graph you get, uh, which returns the, uh, the value of this function, which I call energy, right? For all the possible values. So as you see here, there are three specific cases which has the lowest energy. Uh, and those happen to be the three specific solutions, as I said in the beginning for this problem. So now to solve this, uh, uh, so, so of course, I mean, doing this uh, classically for a larger and larger graph becomes a, a exponentially complex problem. Uh, so rather the approach used is to see how, if we can map this to a physical system, uh, which uh, uh, can naturally move towards the low energy solution. So because, it, because any physical system, if you consider, uh, they naturally have a tendency to uh, move towards the lowest energy state. Right, so so can we map this equation to a physical system, which will naturally move to a low energy state? Okay, so so this is where the quantum annealing approach uh, comes into play. So where we map this kind of equation to a, a quantum mechanical Hamiltonian. So that is shown here. Uh, so so this particular cubo that is shown here is mapped to this kind of uh, this part of this Hamiltonian, which is called the final Hamiltonian. So the initial Hamiltonian, which is shown here, is is uh, the the condition uh, with which the with which the uh, the the qubit start. Okay, so I think I'll explain that uh, through this text. So the solution in a quantum mechanical sense uh, to this problem starts by uh, having uh, all the qubits start in a superposition state. Okay, so as we know, superposition state is zero plus one, uh, which is a eigenvalue of uh, sigma x. So that's the initial Hamiltonian that you see here. But we want the system to move from the initial Hamiltonian towards the final Hamiltonian and to the lowest energy state of the final Hamiltonian. Okay. So, so in, in energy landscape, uh, in the superposition state, uh, the energy of the quantum mechanical system is, is, is shown here. And once the annealing process, process begins, so what the annealing process does is uh, uh, it adds uh, bias to the qubits. So, for example, in this case, it's a four node problem. So, we need, uh, 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 sorry, it's a problem with six edges. So, we need six qubits. Uh, and to model this kind of uh, uh, equation into the Hamiltonian, what it does is it adds a bias to model the weights of these individual terms. And to model the weights of these quadra quadratic terms, it uh, adds a, a coupling factor. Okay, so so the annealing process uh, uh, runs where the barrier is raised, which uh, leads to a double potential. So so right now in a superposition state, there is no distinction between zero and one. Uh, so during the annealing process, a barrier barrier is added using magnetic fields. Uh, which creates a distinction between zero and one. Uh, after that, a bias is added, which is proportional to the weights of these individual terms, 
which changes the energy levels bit, between the zero and one state. Okay. And the couplers uh, enable entanglement, which models the these interactions which are there in this equation. Uh, okay. Uh, and uh, and during the annealing process, uh, the the these weights, namely bias and couplers, are slowly increased, which in turn changes the Hamiltonian from the initial Hamiltonian slowly towards the final Hamiltonian. So that is shown in this graph here. So the 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 AS and the BS. Uh, so the AS reduces over time and BS picks up over time. Uh, so that uh, towards the end of annealing, uh, this exact equation uh, is what gets encoded into the quantum circuit, and the lowest energy state is where it will settle to, which is the solution of this problem. Okay, and uh, the the other quantum mechanical feature which uh, comes into play here is quantum tunneling. So as you see here, so th this this is a local minima, so the circuit should not get stuck in this local minima. And uh, so, uh, in quantum tunneling, we know that there are this, there are solutions of the Schrodinger equation, which uh, has points outside the the quantum well, right? So, uh, so, so the tunneling helps the system to move from this local minima to to, to this side, uh, bypassing this uh, local maxima here, so that the system really moves towards the actual. Uh, global minima. So this kind of uh, a scheme is uh, implemented in the D-Wave uh, uh, computers. Uh, so these are some snapshots from the D-Wave computer where each of these vertical and horizontal lines that you see are, are the qubits and the overlaps are showing the uh, interaction between them. So, uh, and uh, so these are uh, internal couplers, which shows the interaction between the horizontal lines and the vertical lines, and between such groups, also there are interactions, which is I think more clear in in this picture. So, so this kind of a problem is uh, mapped by a software to this kind of a hardware, and then the annealing process kicks in, which uh, helps in solving the problem. Okay, so the last scheme I'll cover is uh, Gaussian boson sampling. Uh, and uh, this particular scheme uh, uh, does not use qubits, uh, but as, as you will see, it uh, uh, employs uh, in a more evident way some quantum mechanical features. So let's walk through that. So this is the circuit, uh, typical circuit that you'll see for Gaussian boson sampling. Uh, and uh, so at the input of this circuit, you will see a vacuum state. Uh, so vacuum, as we know, is a special quantum mechanical property, which has uh, uh, zero photons, but uh, non-zero energy. So, so that's the input state. Uh, the next step is uh, this S gates that you see here, which is uh, squeezing. So squeezing is a mechanism which is, uh, uh, helps to trade off the uncertainty between two quadrature fields. So, so here what we are applying is the electromagnetic field. Uh, and as per quantum mechanics, uh, there is a uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty between the two quadrature electromagnetic fields. Uh, but what squeezing does is it uh, trades off the uncertainty. So it makes one of the quadratures uh, uh, more precise uh, at the cost of uh, worsening the precision of the other quadrature. So in effect, the net uncertainty still remains the same respecting quantum mechanics between the two quadratures, but one of the quadratures is more precise. So, so that's what the squeezing does. Uh, so doing squeezing uh, changes the uh, photon number. So originally vacuum had zero photons, but uh, squeezing uh, makes the photon number greater than zero. Okay. After that, uh, 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 these states pass through uh, uh, a unitary, which is shown here, which is uh, some rotation gates followed by some beam splitters. So, so this is where uh, the other quantum mechanical property called uh, wave function interference uh, happens, uh, where through the various arms of the beam splitter, uh, there is an interference between the wave functions of the various states. 
So this particular scheme is called uh, Gaussian boson sampling because uh, uh, the input states uh, are Gaussian in nature. Uh, so basically, the probability distribution function is of Gaussian type, uh, and the unitary is also Gaussian. So which means as the state passes through it, it still retains uh, uh, its its Gaussianness. Okay, and the sampling word at the end is because of the the detectors we have at the end which is a photon number count uh, measuring detectors. So, so this kind of uh, uh, circuit, uh, GPS circuit, uh, can be used to solve some specific uh, kind of problems, uh, like graph optimization or some graph similarity problems. So one of the examples I have used is uh, densest subgraph uh, problem. Okay, so, so the problem is basically if we have a graph, uh, with the uh, M nodes, let's say M is equal to 4. Uh, how do we identify a subgraph uh, of size K? Let's say K is 3, uh, which has the maximum number of interconnects. So, for example, for this 4 node graph, a very simple example, the, the densest 3 node subgraph is this one because it has the highest number of uh, edges, which is 3. So, 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 this GBS can be used to solve this kind of a problem. So I have illustrated that uh, here. Uh, so as I said, the goal is to extract the densest K node subgraph from a, a M node graph. Uh, so to do that, we need uh, to build a M state setup. So in this example, we need to build as I show in this picture a four node uh, setup. Okay. After that, uh, mathematically which is offline, we need to, the Gaussian unitary and the input squeezing levels are worked out. So what should be, what should exactly be this Gaussian unitary and what should be the input squeezing levels? Uh, so that is uh, worked out and mapped on this circuit. Okay, and in this calculation, uh, it is also ensured that the mean photon number on the input is equal to K. I think this is an important point uh, because uh, we are trying to find uh, a densest k node subgraph. So in this example, a densest three node subgraph. So the the mean photon number on the input is uh, uh, set to k mathematically uh, by the squeezing levels which are applied. So after that, the circuit uh, comes into play, and uh, what we do is measure the photon numbers on all the m outputs. And this is where the magic happens. So so the quantum mechanical uh, wave function interference that happens within the circuit uh, directly solves the problem. Okay, so the solution in this case uh, uh, is the case when the K output modes will show one photon and remaining M minus K output nodes will show no photons. So for example, if uh, the densest three node subgraphs were node uh, 0, 1, 2, right? So then what we'll expect to see is on node 0, on output 0, output 1 and output 2, we will see one photon each and no photons on the other outputs. And uh, hence we know the solution is the subgraph with nodes 0, 1, and 2. So, so that's the kind of uh, magic this, this, this circuit creates. Okay, so I think we have uh, uh, seen with the examples uh, how these three schemes work. So I'll try to summarize uh, the differences between them for a high level uh, take home, right? Uh, what is the, or how do they compare? So, so gate based, uh, we saw uses quantum gates. Uh, annealing, we saw uh, it uh, tries to optimize the cost function mapped onto a matrix of qubits. Uh, GBS uh, uses Gaussian states, Gaussian unitary with photon number measurement. So, uh, in other words, uh, gate-based uses uh, qubits and gates, uh, and this uh, makes it uh, uh, also implementable using other me other methods like MBQC. Okay. This guy uses uh, qubits with biases and couplers, uh, and uh, GBS uses bosonic state, the photons, uh, and and gates. So, uh, gate-based is suitable for solving various kinds of problems. Uh, I took one example, but there are others like factoring, sorting, optimizations. Uh, and optimization 
typically what you see it's called as vq or vqe or qao techniques uh, which are used to solve combinatorial problems uh, using a hybrid quantum classical approach so the, all that is possible with gate based quantum annealing uh, is for a specific class of combinatorial optimization problems uh, where the pass function is optimized uh, and the gbs is more suitable for specific graph kind of uh, problems so so obviously it makes sense that uh, gate based is what is considered as universal and the other two are not universal uh, and uh, thinking of uh, the future like how the quantum computing will scale uh, so for uh, gate based to scale we need the quality qubits uh, at scale to produce the quantum advantage whereas quantum annealing today uh, we call today's era as the nisc era it's already producing results which is useful to the industry and comparable to to classical uh, and uh, for gbs Uh, to scale uh, the amount of squeezing and losses in these problems needs to be uh, addressed uh gate based supports error correction uh, right so, so so that's good it being universal and supporting error correction it can solve more problems as the time goes by uh quantum annealing is uh, uh, not amenable to error correction so which means the if if this has to scale we need to improve the quality of the qubits natively uh and for this uh the error correction is not applicable because there are no qubits we are talking in that scheme uh, uh gate based is uh, implementable using static qubits or flying qubits so i think biman will touch upon this topic uh what do you mean by static and flying qubits uh quantum annealing is with static qubits and uh, gbs is with the bosonic gates photons as we saw okay Yeah, so that's all I uh, had. Uh, so I guess I'll hand over to Biman to deep dive further into the uh, hardware aspects. Thank you, Gopal. So I will start off. Uh... is my screen visible yes sir okay yeah uh, so in the onset at the onset i want to thank uh, christ college the university and i triple e for giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, certain features of quantum computing and quantum hardware uh, so the way i want to uh, uh, go about is that some of the topics which uh, aditi and gopal covered so some of the terms that are being used there and go in little bit more details a uh, little bit of more deep dive into uh, those topics so one of the thing is that we want to talk about from a hardware point of view uh, how is the qubit implemented okay so uh, going to like the terms like what is a stationary qubit like a, when you implement qubits in um, in as matter or circuit based qubits similarly you can in, implement qubits in light modes so called flying qubits so uh, we will talk about that then we would go to these computational models and uh, gopal talked about the different uh, computational models we would go a little bit more in depth on the gate based model because that's something that eventually gives us the ability to do a fault tolerant computer the, the so to say the the source al algorithm and uh mapping the digital uh, computation into the corresponding quantum digital computation that is the path towards gate based computing so we'll talk about that and in that we have to bring in the concept of something called a measurement based quantum computing it's an idea which uh, 
a way of doing gate based computing, but it's a very interesting idea and very relevant when we talk about flying qubits or light modes. So people who are interested, especially with photonic based quantum computing would find this uh, uh, topic especially useful and interesting, I believe. And in, in that uh, process, we have to talk about uh, entanglement and teleportation, very relevant, especially uh, like at this point, the, the 2022 uh, Nobel Prize was related to this. So what better time than talk about it now? Uh, and we would also talk a little bit about the implement, implementation choices in photonics. I would think that getting a feel of the hardware would also help to appreciate the overall landscape. So let's uh, go with qubit implementation. So we know that mat there is a matter-based qubits which are like trapped ion, cold atom, or the spin of an, uh, uh, the nucleus of an atom. So in all these cases, right, what is being uh, done is that, that we are storing the information of the qubit the quantum information in the energy states or spin states of an atom. So the basic quantum uh, element is either energy state, which is something naturally in a cold atom, in atom or ion, and or spin. So those are like quantum quantum uh, number uh, of the of the atom. And this trapped ion or cold atom, these are just way of ensuring that the atom doesn't go away. So you trap the atom so that the, the, or trap the at, atom, you know, to trap, you may require charge. So you have a trapped ion. But what we are really using out of that is that, that the state, the energy state on the spin state of an atom. Uh, or you can also do something like an energy in a resonator. So like, for example, superconducting loops, transmon, superconducting computers are, it's is a resonator and the energy in the resonator is what is the quantum of uh, like a, of what what makes the qubit or a cavity qed so the, the the feature that you would see common in all these things is that that we are working with extremely small amount of energy uh, like energy levels separation of energy levels so it's like a at a qubit uh, is like uh, at a single photon level Right. Similarly, when we are talking about superconducting loop, we are talking of energy of one quanta. Okay, so effectively, what gives out or makes the process as quantum is the ability to handle energy or this at a very very small uh, uh, at at the level of like one quanta. Okay, and uh, this the, the 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 practical aspect of it is like how do you create a like a container for actually having those energies to be there. So a trapped ion, cold atom, those are like you isolate single atoms or in, in case of a superconducting thing, you are actually having a physically big structure like uh, uh, it, it's like hundreds of micron in size, but then you cool it down to a point where superconductive effects uh, come in and then that whole collection of electrons in that superconducting loop behaves as a, a single quantum entity. Uh, so uh, here in this case, for example, energy and resonator, the, the basic quanta of energy is a resonance structure of a harmonic oscillator or an harmonic oscillator. So in these cases, you, you'd see that, that we are either trapping or we are having a physical structure. So qubit does reside in one place it's kind of stationary and is analogous to a classical bit in a uh, register. So the next thing is that once you have got a qubit, you have to manipulate and do some operation on it, right? This one thing is to store the qubit, then you have to do operation on that. So uh, in, in some sense, you can see that there is a very uh, nice parallel between classical computation and quantum computation in the sense that, that you have you initialized the, uh, the, the, the qubits, you manipulate them according to a desired program, and then you read out by measurement. So this flow, right, that what you are seeing here is like, uh, like, like a, what is described in a gate diagram, where it shows 
initialization, the manipulation, and the uh, readout. And this particular form of like representing the problem statement is what is used in the gate-based quantum computing model. And the way you model it also uh, dictates or, or, or influences the choice in which you implement it, right? Because you have to have this corresponding flow chart of things being implemented in terms of something which is physical, right? In terms of uh, storing the information in, in qubits and in manipulating them according to what those gates are asking it to do. But there, there, so uh, before I move a little bit on this one, I just want to uh, point out a few subtle difference between this, this the quantum gate diagram and the digital gate diagram. Digital gate diagram. Like if there are uh, people with uh, electrical electronics background or computer science background, I think you might have seen digital gate diagrams. Uh, so it would be interesting to uh, see that a little bit of differences are there so that if, if, so if we point that out, I think certain confusions that usually happen otherwise can be addressed upfront. So in a digital gate diagram, this is like a typical digital gate diagram, right? With AND gates, OR gates, uh, XOR gates, and so on. So uh, usually when you draw such a diagram, it is a combinatorial uh, circuit with implicit inputs of A, B, C, which are given there. And like what is really happening is that, that we are uh, giving the value of A, B, and C, it gets com computed. There are intermediate points which are different from the input. And then the final value comes out on the, like this is a error kind of a circuit. So onto the final output. So here the gates are irreversible and the, uh, obviously there is no requirement for input to be equal to the output and uh, so on. So the point is that this is the combinatorial circuit and we are like kind of looking at the uh, a, a logical computation from A, B, C to uh, S and C, the outputs. When you talk about a quantum gate diagram, uh, it is actually better to call it a state machine, okay, uh, or a flow chart, like what you would see in, let's say, in a computer uh, programming, you have the flow chart. The only thing is that you draw it horizontally, so to say. And if you think of it like that is a probably a, a, a better analogy because we are talk, working with quantum states and their evolution. So a state machine is going to capture that, right? So uh, in a way, if you think of it that way, but, but the, the way this is drawn is very similar to a gate diagram. So sometimes there are uh, some confusions that crop up because of that. So what, what it, this really represents, right, is that, that you have th these inputs which are, let's say, three different qubits, three, three locations in space where you are having these qubits held. And then each of these gate operations is, is actually acting and modifying the content of the qubit. You can use energy, pulses of microwave or a, or a flash of light uh, to do that, uh, that evolution. And what we are really having is that when you have a where, this is like saying that there is no computation happening. Like those are like holding the value. Uh, and by the prince, these gates are reversible. Okay, so that's something that is, uh, uh, when we are modeling this particular way of doing in, in quantum mechanics, we are, when you're using quantum mechanical evolution, uh, which are uh, unitary, okay? So they are reversible gates. So this is something that happens because the way you want to evolve uh, these qubits using Hamiltonian, it imposes the constraint that those gates are reversible. And uh, at the end, you do a computation. Uh, at the end of the computation, we read out the state. So effectively, it is looking like a like a evolution of state uh, through different uh, Hamiltonians or uh, unitary uh, uh, operations on the different qubits or a pair of qubits as well. So one of the things to note here is that that what this is implying is that that you have to have certain locations where you have the qubit, where you actually work directly on those locations. Like if you're, you're really not copying it out from there and doing computation, writing it back somewhere else, you're actually working on those locations themselves, okay? And there are interactions, so it would mean that, that those uh, qubits have to be physically located close by in order for interaction to happen when you are, in, let's say, introducing this, like if uh, those who, are aware of this quantum gate diagram, like a C naught gate and so on, when you are 
when you're going to be interaction, you need to have those inputs available and in, make them interact. So these points would become uh, like what or the implications of that if you let, let's say want to do something with light, where lights are flying away. So the reason for bringing up this uh, description is that that this would become uh, relevant. So that that if we were to work with something of this diagram where this is suitable and where such a description actually makes uh, the thing difficult. Okay, so I just try to highlight that. So before that, let's see that uh, uh, we talked about the stationary qubits, atoms, ions, spin qubits, uh, or these different uh, superconducting qubits. So what are the challenges uh, in 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 this form of like storing the quantum information? Is that that these require isolation from the environment? Okay, and the reason behind that is that that uh, uh, the energy levels in which it works are at a level where they can get very easily influenced by thermal excitation or by like whether it's or electrical magnetic uh, or EM kind of uh, influences. So in case of atoms and ions, they require isolation in the form of like very high vacuum. Uh, and then you actually use lasers to make these uh, atoms or ions stationary. Okay, means uh, it's like you, you make the atoms and ions stationary like as if it is cooled down to nano kelvins of temperature. Okay, so the, uh, here we are working with a few atoms and uh, ions, but each of the atom ions are cooled down to nano kelvins. Uh, in case of a, a spin qubit, uh, also there's requirement of isolation, so cryogenic temperatures required for that. Uh, similarly, when we talk about superconducting qubits in order to re reach the superconductivity and in order to work at a level where it is, uh, 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 which is like a gigahertz photon range, right? Like if you are looking at the energy content of the superconducting, the flux and the charge, that, that the energy is in the order of gigahertz photon range. And so that me means that we have to cool down the setup to 15 millikelvin or thereabouts in terms of millikelvins. Uh, level. So the practical requirement of this technology is elaborate cooling and or vacuum systems. So uh, in terms of the scalability, like if we want to, let's say, now we have 120 uh, or let's say uh, 100, 200 uh, uh, qubits. If you want to scale, one of the practical limitation of scalability is the, the 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 requirement of cooling and vacuum system is that is that that is uh, required for really making these systems work. So of course we can look at alternative approaches, and uh, one of the thing is photonic qubits. Uh, so a quantum of photon, like if you work at the optical range of optical frequency range, okay, or uh, infrared. Uh, those are at an energy level which is much above the thermal range. Okay, and so as a result of that, there is a inherent uh, uh, stability of these things from being influenced by environment. So photons uh, do not, uh, or photon does not uh, interact with the environment, and photonic quantum computing can happen at room temperature. Okay, so the the, the bulk of this operation of uh, gate operation measurement all these things there is a there is a path towards making them happen at room temperature i would show like what are the components that actually go in in building that and how they are room temperature uh, uh, operational in at room temperature there is but there is a, a very interesting thing that 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 if something is not going to interact with the environment it's not going to interact with each other also. So the very non-interacting nature of photons uh, poses challenge for photon-photon interaction. So when you want to do, let's say, two qubit gate operation, okay? So you need now photons to interact. Now the problem is that that the photons' non-interacting nature makes them uh, something that it is they will they will not. Uh, be able now you're not able to do a two a two qubit gate okay the other problem is that that photons are flying qubits 
So what I mean by that is that, that once you have generated, let's say, a pulse of light, the pulse of light is going to uh, propagate in its, in its, if it is in a free space, it is going to go in a straight line. If it is in a fiber optic cable, it is going to propagate in that fiber optical cable. So, of course, uh, this is a good thing when you want to do only communication. Okay, if you want, if you're only interested in doing, let's say, communication, fiber optical communication, photons had been the workhorse of, uh, uh, like, the backbone of, like, the internet, right? So, this is when you are using photons for communicating, and if the only thing that you are interested in is to come, is to let it uh, go from one place to another. But what if you want to do quantum computation? Okay, in this case, what you require is that that there are multiple modes of light, which are uh, the fact that there are multiple qubits would mean there are multiple modes of light, and then they have to interact. And in order to interact, they have to be brought to the same place. So let's say that you have three or uh, multiple qubits that are being uh, been sent out. Now they are like propagating in, on in in fiber optical wire. How would you bend and bring them together when you need them? Right. So this, so these are the two things which are interesting problems that come up in a photonic qubit, a flying qubit, and uh, to solve them is something that is required if you want to use photonic qubits. So let's see that there are how, how can that be do done, and there are like very interesting ways by which these problems can be addressed. And uh, uh, so that, let's see enter the stage entanglement and teleportation. Okay, so. These are two concepts that uh, are very useful in uh, trying to circumvent these upper two problems. So I just wanted to give a brief, uh, uh, like a snapshot of what entanglement teleportation is, uh, so that uh, in the flow of discussion, uh, things are clear. Okay. Uh, so this is a quantum gate diagram. So what is present here, let me just uh, first show this diagram, okay? So what we are having here is that, that we have two qubits, okay, which are uh, like the phi A plus and the phi B plus. And this is a very special kind of, so th th these are two separate qubits, but they have a very special characteristics, which is, what what, what the, their state is represented by this particular form. Okay. Now, for people who are not very familiar with uh, with this notation, which is a cape notation, uh, let me just like uh, try to word it in in terms of like what this means. But again, like a mathematical concept, when when put in terms of uh, English language, it it can actually color it in certain ways. So uh, so. Uh, uh, let me just try to be this thing. Okay, so uh, so a little bit of caution on that. So what what it what this means is that although these are two separate qubits A and B, they are in entangled state, which means that that if I measure A and I find a value of uh, if I find a value of uh, zero, if I measure the value of zero on A, then if I measure B. I am going to also find the value of B. That means the the value of A and B are correlated to be of the same value. Now you might, uh, if I measure one, then I measure one. Now you may say that okay, that's fine. Means uh, let's say that I have copied uh, the two values uh, like uh, in two registers and they are like having zero zero and one one, right? And if I measure this, the other value is zero. So what is so special about that process? Like means that then there is nothing special. So, so in that thing, uh, the thing is that that even if the phi a and uh, phi b, okay, these are separated out in space, and then I manipulate the value of phi a, then after that manipulation, if I measure phi a, whatever I see, I again see the same value in phi b. So that's where the 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 way to look at it is that although I am saying phi a and phi b as two separate entity, in terms of quantum mechanical state, it's actually a single state which are which is actually uh, uh, spread between those two separate entities. 
So if there is one thing that you have to first like uh, from a quantum mechanical point, what is what is the part that you have to accept or get used to in this particular explanation is the fact that such a thing actually happens that the phi a and phi b, the two qubits which are separated in space, is a single entity. And I want to like uh, be careful in mentioning that that I am not saying that when I measure phi a, the value of phi a is propagated to phi b. I am not using that statement very consciously. Uh, in, in English, it, it is very easy to say that, okay, when I measure phi A, whatever is the state that I see, it's transported to phi B, okay? The teleportation term sometimes actually is, is a very popular term, so we you always use it, but the right way of actually appreciating this is that, that phi A and phi B is a single entity, and that's why when I, it's like saying that, that if I do phi A, the influence on phi B is like, it's, it's one th single thing, like if you, if you, uh, uh, it is not that, that you have to imagine a flow of information from, from phi A to phi B, okay? It is that one single entity. So if I look at one part of the entity, it defines everything for the whole entity, that kind of a description. And the other aspect that is probably uh, in, in important to understand in this uh, context is that, that if you see that it is written as 00 AB plus 11 AB, the reason that this is the thing about superposition that uh, it's not that that phi a and phi b, when I'm talking of phi a, it is either zero or one. It can be in a zero and zero and one. That means there is a finite probability of a quantum, finite quantum probability of collapsing to zero or one. And whatever the collapse that happens on a happens on b as well. And vice versa, if, if I were to measure phi b before, then whatever the collapse that happens on phi b is going to happen on phi a also, okay? So uh, on the qubit A also. So uh, it's so there are these two these two features are actually what is uh, what makes this an entangled state. So th there's a superposition, but in, along with that, that there's a single entity which uh, if you measure, then you see the same corresponding value on the other one. So it's a correlation in here. Now this correlation, you could set up something by which you can say that I can do the correlation in a classical fashion also. Okay, like for example, if you were to uh, uh, let's say set the same value of the two things at the same time or have a communication channel between them and so on. But the fact that this is a quantum correlation, okay, is something that requires some additional proof of how do you prove that this is a quantum correlation. And uh, it would be pertinent to say that this year's uh, Nobel Prize is an experimental proof of showing that such a correlation is a uh, quantum correlation. By the way, this, this thing that I have drawn here, this 00 plus 11 is, a, is what is known as Bell state. And uh, to prove that if something is in a Bell state, there is a, something called a Bell inequality violation. That is a correlation between the two, uh, two states if you measure and look at the correlation, that correlation is something that you can never get by classical me me method. And uh, proving that your know, optical setup is what had been uh, uh, the, the key thing that was uh, uh, part of the Nobel uh, Prize of this year. So effectively, this is like saying that for like, uh, to prove what is called a Bell inequality violation. So we are going to use a, a similar concept here, okay? So we start with entangled states, which are in, in a, what is called a Bell state, to be precise, okay? And then what we do is that, that I want to send the state, which is present in a third qubit, which is, let's say, the C qubit, and I want to, whatever is the state of phi of, uh, shy of C, C, I want to, have that state being present in the qubit of psi of B. How do I take the state of qubit of psi of C? Okay, it can be in a superposition state, it can be zero, one, it can be a, a, a combination of zero and one, whatever is the state of psi of C, I want to see, I, I want to have that state on in psi of B, uh, in, in, this, in this B qubit. So the method for doing that is that you start with a qubit which is in entangled state, and they can be physically separated, but as I again want to iterate that it is like a single uh, 
entity in a quantum mechanical sense. Okay. Now you uh, interact the qubit uh, C, the one that you want to teleport uh, with qubit A. Okay. And this is a C naught gate. Uh, it is similar to an XOR gate. Uh, uh, but okay, uh, but what you are doing is that you are actually influencing what is more important in for our discussion. You are interacting and passing on the information of psi C to psi A uh, uh, to qubit C from qubit C and to A qubit A. Okay, they then interact, and then there is a particular measurement protocol, like you do a Hadamard and then you do a measurement. Uh, in the next slide, I have the maths for that. But again, the point is that that, that look at the 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 things that that are being done here. We are having a entangled state. We have an interaction followed by measurement. When we do that, what happens is that that the state of psi, psi of, uh, of qubit C comes on the state of qubit of B. So this particular thing of entanglement and teleportation is something that allows information to be taken from one place to another place, even when they are physically separated. Okay, and the how this thing happens is a purely quantum mechanical uh, process. So the the thing that is, uh, if we have to point out one thing that you need to understand or accept from a quantum mechanical aspect is the this entangled state. Okay, and if you try to under if if you were to try to get this in a classical sense and try to form a classical picture of this particular entangled state. In terms of by talking about uh, communication between these two qubits and so on, then you would be stuck with a like a quagmire. You will not be able to appreciate what's going on. So that's uh, with this background of entanglement and, and teleportation. I think uh, so. Th here there is the maths. I would not go into the detail of the maths that is there. But if you were to run through this, you would see that like. Uh, if you start with this this state, which is a superposition state, if you start with uh, here is D is, or D is the data or the C or the way the other qubit, which is in a superposition state of uh, zero and one, and if you were to do the bell uh, the bell measurement that is being shown there, okay, and if you run through that experiment that thing, you would see that. You have that the state of in teleported with some Pauli operation, which is like a, a, a trivial gate operation, which was shown here by these things. So based on the based on the measurement result, you have to modify uh, the state, but that is a trivial operation based on the uh, measured value. And of course, if you can see that unless you do this. Uh, uh, this based on the measurement result, if, unless you do this operation, you would end up with a state which is not exactly the state of C. Instead of psi, you would get which is a inverted version of it or with a phase flip and so on. So fundamentally, uh, the teleportation to be to be faithful, you still need the fact that you need the information of the the classical output that is coming out as the measurement result. And the fact that you need the measurement result, and you have to you have to you have to trans you have to communicate the result from uh, from the uh, from psi of c measurement the c and a qubit to b that is a classical communication thing, and that's why the in order for uh, the the state to go from psi c to psi b for for your practical use, you we are limited by the communication speed between the C to B. Okay, but it, so that is why it is not that it is not violating the violating the speed of light as as far as the communication of uh, teleporting is concerned. But uh, so here is the math which shows that why you need that Z and X and so on. Okay, so uh, basic summary is that that entanglement and local measurement. You can uh, you can do a quantum information teleportation, but you also need additional unitary transformation, which is based on the measurement result. So now let us uh, come to so now that we have this uh, in the backdrop, we would like to now talk about how a floating qubit, uh, sorry, a flying qubit, or a photonic mode can be used for 
uh, solving the two problems that we the problems that we talked about, like how do we uh, 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 how do we uh, ensure that uh, even with a flying qubit we can make it work? But now, in for that, I think one one thing we need some more clarification that when we talked about let's say the stationary qubits, we talked about the energy as the as the content of information, something getting mapped, the information of zero and one getting mapped to the energy or the uh, the flux. Of a particular uh, of a particular uh, structure, right? Now, in case of uh, light modes, what is that uh, physical measured physical feature which is representing the qubit? Okay, there are various ways by which you can you can actually use light pulses, and uh, the reason why we to bring out this specifically is that that. Uh, uh, let's say fundamentally, when we talk about like classical optical communication, we are using intensity, right, most of the time, or intensity and phase when we are using coherent communication. So, for example, what is the corresponding thing in case of uh, uh, when we are talking about quantum communication? Uh, sorry, quantum uh, qubits in photonics. Uh, so, in you can use single photons where you are actually having a precise uh, energy. And uh, that photon can be in a waveguide. And if we have a single waveguide, the presence or absence of the photon is a one or a zero. That's something called a single rail uh, encoding. Of so you are you are represent you are having a precise amount of energy in a pulse, and that energy being present is one and being absent is zero. And the fact that it is in a quantum state, you can actually have a situation where you can have a superposition of that. Now, the issue with uh, this particular uh, kind of an representation is that, that if the photon is lost, then you go from 1 to 0, and then you declare that I am at state 0. So if you lose the photon, you go to a, one of the state, which is something. So you have no way of uh, distinguishing whether you lost the photon for, from, by some uh, non-idealities, or is it that, the, that, that the, you are actually sending a state 0. Okay, so uh, so that's something that gets addressed to in a two wave guide system because uh, now you have two wave guides. If the photon is present in one, the first wave guide you call it list one, and if in the second wave guide you call it zero, vice versa. Either way, so you you are now saying that the presence you will always have a photon, depending on where the photon is present, you would call it one or a zero. So if if there is no photon, then you know that something has gone wrong. Okay, so you have a you have a way of error correction mechanism built into such a system. If you have a two uh, wave guide uh, for representing one qubit, so you have a two wave guide, and then the photon is present in one or the other. Uh, this is so called dual rail uh, uh, qubit or dual rail encoding. Uh, the reason I wanted to even talk about it is that, that for example, if you think of a company called Psi Quantum, who are building based on uh, a qubit based a qubit of a of a single photon based uh, quantum computer, and their approach is to use this dual rail qubits. Okay, uh, then there is uh, other approaches like for polarization of light is something which can contain the information of zero and one. Uh, of course, uh, when you want to integrate it into an into an IC or if you want to build a compact uh, photonic computer, then polarization is something that is difficult to handle in a chip. So there are tactical aspects of how you select one versus the other. Okay, I mean, so we'll talk about that thing. That that. So this is kind of a practical uh, choice of how you go about doing things. Um, then there is a, the other approach is squeezed light, and other encoded bosonic states. Okay, so uh, I would with I would touch upon what squeezed light is. Uh, Gopal talked about it a little bit, but the Basic takeaway is that that unlike a single photon, where you start working with one photon, one precise uh, pulse of uh, one precise quantum of energy, squeezed light is a superposition state of multiple photons. Okay, but it has the superposition is very very well orchestrated, so to say, and in in such a manner that it has very specific properties. Okay. And what property are you talking about? That if you were to measure the, 
the field called elliptic field quadrature, like it, it, because uh, light is uh, electromagnetic phase, you can measure the electric field or magnetic field, you can measure the electric field quadrature. What, what is meant by electric field quadrature is that, that you can measure electric field with a sine component or cosine component. Effectively, you can, because there is a phase associated with uh, with light, it's not just about intensity, there is a phase, right? So it is it has information which is which would which would require you to decompose light into two quadratures uh, to fully represent the particular the, the nature of light. And what what this squeeze light is that that if you were to decompose the light and look at the light in two, one of the quadrature, you would see that you get a very precise information, very precise value. If you were to decompose in the other quadrature, you would get a pretty uh, spread out. The value can be different in run to run. Effectively, this is a fundamental principle which we have probably known for long, which is Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So there is, it is like saying that that uh, we can uh, we can if you do do two different separate measurements of the light, the the two uh, measurements of the elliptic field are related by Heisenberg uncertainty principle. But more about that a little bit later. But I think the the the, the point is that 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 there are there are multiphoton states which has features which which is can be measured in the form of electric field quadrature, and the electric field quadrature can be a variable of interest to represent quantum information. Okay, so now uh, it is apparent that the first one when I was talking about was very easy to talk about because it's a very conceptually simple picture, right? We are having single photons mapped to a qubit. I understand a qubit. I understand a single photon. Uh, so it's a it's a very one to one easy qubit to photon mapping, uh, conceptually simple picture, and. Uh, this particular method is called discrete variable encoding because the values that the single photon can take is present absent like that, right? So you can decompose it into uh, like discrete variable, discrete values. Whereas the squeeze light or encoded bosonic states, these are multiphoton states. And I think you would have already anticipated this, the fact that when there are multiple photons and we are talking about uh, something like a, electric field okay so now we can no longer work with a discrete variable we are actually st starting starting to work with a continuous variable okay so the representation is no longer like a one to one that i know this and then i can immediately map to a qubit but that should not deter us from exploring this approach because there are a lot of in interesting features of civic photonics okay the continuous variable photonics which is which makes it a good implementation choice so once we Cross the initial hurdle of like the fact that okay the the, the treatment of of uh, this thing is continuous variable so not as as one to one, but you will very soon see that continuous variable is a description, and then you can actually use the description of continuous variable to be mapped to something which is a discrete variable, and in in which case you can use all the things that you have been doing for discrete variable and use all the concept in con continuous variable, but we have to start the description of the problem in terms of continuous variable and put the right kind of layerings to convert it into a discrete variable. So there is this one extra step of understanding that is required in order to understand uh, uh, continuous variable problems. But again, the advantages that you give in terms of implementation, I will talk about in a moment, that kind of puts the case of why CV is becoming so popular. So uh, just a quick, uh, uh, like a, probably a, a detour onto the squeeze state of in CV. So light mode in in a vacuum state, like when we let's say we are in a vacuum state and we want to measure the electric field, uh, you can decompose even like a light where there is no light. Okay, that like a like a vacuum state. If you were to measure electric field, you can get a number and that value has a spread. This is because of quantum uncertainty. Okay, like if you measure electric field in in a in something where there is a vacuum, you can actually get a value for field. If you were to think of classically, you should expect nothing, right? There is no light. There should not be no electric field. But in case of uh, electric field uh, measurement in 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 a quantum, if you were to go down to a quantum level of accurate uh, uh, precision, you would see that you can measure electric field even in vacuum. And 
you can do this measurement in two different quadrature that means you use the sine or a cos component to do the correlation and do the measurement so to, let's say imagine two different settings of the phase be, before measuring doing this measurement if you were to do this measurement those two measurements have a very much similarity like momentum and position of a harmonic oscillator so people who are familiar with harmonic oscillator if in a quantum mechanical setting the so called the p and the q or the x and the uh, p and the x and the p variables of uh, describing the motion of a, of of a oscillator that duality those that uncertainty principle between p and q very similar thing is seen in electric field measurement for the two different quadratures and that's why uh, you would see that many a time people just call quadrature people call p and q but what they are really meaning for the context of light is not really momentum and position they are talking about two different quadratures or two different electric field measurements and uh, uh, the, the, when you are having like a vacuum that that is like a, uh, the, there is equal variance in measurement if you measure in different settings of the of the uh, phase you would see always the same variance of measurement but if that uh, the light is the squeezed state like a squeezed vacuum you would see that one of the measurement would be very precise it will not have variance it will like give a very precise value of zero while the other one would have a much bigger spread of the measurement of the of the electric field so kind of the zero that you are measuring is like saying that you know i am having a precise value and that can represent the so called eigen state or a state by which you can describe your problem so you like you require precise values right like 0 1 2 3 like right. that can be obtained by squeezing uh a, a squeeze state of light actually starting if if i were to decouple that term to make it less uh, exotic hearing okay it's it's like saying that okay, that i work with a special state of light which had been specially uh, created which is which when measured in a certain manner have a gives out a very precise value of electric field this is what the crux of a squeeze state is and that is something that is required for describing continuous variable systems so uh, a pictorial picture uh, so, so that we have something in mind is like if, if it's if a gaussian state is like p and q is equally distributed if you were to uh, position q, uh, squeeze it q is position by the way and p is momentum so momentum squeezing is like when the momentum value is uh, 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 precise versus the corresponding uh, uh, the the, uh, the position value is very spread out so effectively you are trying to do squeezing to uh, work with the different uh, 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 so here the p and q are nothing but electric field me uh, measurements at two different phases so uh, i i said that that there are advantages of cv photonic what makes it so attractive one is like like cv states like the squeeze state of light that i showed in the previous uh, uh, slide are nothing but these are light which can be generated at generated at room temperature by by special crystals okay and you pump the crystal and what comes out of it is squeeze light so that exotic thing that i was talking about exotic form of light is is something that you can generate in the lab by pumping by a process called the spontaneous parametric down conversion where uh, you can generate light of that characteristics okay and note that this is a room temperature thing where a single photon generation typically requires setups which are cryogenic temperature okay so we so although we talked about photonics the photons are not non interacting but the generation process in case of single photons is uh, requires cold temperature whereas you think of squeeze light now you can generate it at room temperature using opio kind of uh, physical structures there are also opas and other approaches uh, to the generation of squeeze light then the interaction of squeeze light uh, can be done through linear optical elements like splitters couplers okay uh, physical components uh, like a half uh, a half silver mirror these are what you used to do interaction and uh, and the quadrature measurement is done by something called the balanced homogeneity detection 
I think uh, people who are fam familiar with uh, heterodyne and homodyne detection in the context of communication and all would be able to get a sense of it. But uh, yeah, so effectively it's, it's like mixing between the incoming light with a local oscillator and measuring the average value of that. So there are ways of measuring the, uh, the, the, the electric field in, with, a, in, with a system which is operating at room temperature. So uh, these are something that, that gives the basic constituents that are required for building a CV photonic system. Of course, you would require some other uh, uh, items also. So I talked about the bosonic encoding in the in the or uh, that is required. Like one example is a Gottesman Kitter Priskel or a GKP encoding, because what we eventually want is that we want to map the CV Hilbert space, like the continuous variable space, to a discrete variable space. Because all the other modeling model of gate based com computing works with CV uh, uh, DV uh, Hilbert space. So how do we map from CV to uh, DV? We use the gottesman kitter uh, uh, priskel encoding. So there are so so we require some other states other than the squeeze light states, which have this specific property by which you can impose uh, encoding on the, on onto the on, onto the uh, light modes, and that allows you to do uh, CV encoding to G, uh, to DV encoding. And then in the process, given that there's redundancy in CV. This multi-photon state, right? That redundancy can be used to our advantage to do error correction natively at the physical qubit level. So these are advantages in the CV photonics, which why this is a interesting uh, approach. And universal gate operation is achieved in CV by using GKP states. So uh, I would like to now come towards uh, the kind of the, the the two aspects that we talked about that how do we use entangled light to do that same concept of teleportation in the context of a photonic system. So let us say that now I'm going to use CV as my uh, description setup because uh, I have been talking about CV and that's something that we have been uh, also working on as part of our company. So, and that is also, uh, one of the things that has a promise in terms of uh, how to use that in, in the context of, of a CV. So there, what we have to remember is that, that because I'm using CV, so what was a bell pair in this particular, uh, it is called the EPR pair, that uh, Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen, that thought experiment, okay, that EPR experiment. So, and if, if you have uh, probably have noticed that we talked about the different electric field quadratures are like P and Q, like the position momentum. And if you remember also that EPR experiment was proposed in terms of position momentum. So there is a big similarity between the two. But what, what is happening here is that, that if you take squeezed lights in, in the appropriately squeezed light, and if you pass them through Bill splitter, so they would actually get uh, in a, in, into an entangled state called EPR pair. So this is like the first step that was required. I have like put that uh, teleportation diagram. The fact that I require the two A and B to be in in, a, in an entangled state, the equivalent process is take squeeze light, pass through a beam split, and what you get is that A and B in entangled state. Of course, here we'll call it as an EPR pair. So this, this is my A and B. So effectively what I am drawing here is that, imagine this is time point. These are like different time, these are time axes. So in time point one, I have I have generated two squeezed light pulses. In time point two, I generated two squeezed light pulses, and so on. And I pass it through Bill splitter, and at at that same time point, we are now having two modes of light which are in two different physical locations because they are propagating on parallel waveguides. But now they they have a correlation between them through the EPR pair correlation. Next, what we do is that that we have to do that giving this phi of a to phi of c right so i have to prop i have to bring them close by so what is the corresponding thing is that that i put a delay on one of the element one of the path so effectively i am realigning the, the time such that now what happens is that that in the same time slice i have one partner of the epr pair and coexisting with a 
uh, the a part node of the previous pair. Okay, so now this is like C and B have come on the same uh, time window. Okay, so I am, I am temporarily uh, adjusting them so that they are brought close by, so to say, in, in this analogy, the A and C are brought close by. And then I have to do an interaction and measurement. So that is effectively what I'm doing is that if now that A and C are in the same uh, location, so to say, I uh, pass through a view splitter, that kind of does uh, the interaction process and the balance homogeneity detection is the measurement process. And just like in the previous example, in the case of a EPR, uh, uh, in case of a teleportation, we need to know this value and take care of them to uh, do a trivial operation to adjust the state. Similarly, here also we will get the outcome of the value of detector detection, and we can track them classically. But what we have achieved is that that the state of C has hopped from C to B. So effectively, we by the process of measuring A and C, I have consumed of the value of A and C. They do not; they, they no longer exist. They have been passed on, and they are now consumed in the process of value of detection. But the information is not lost. It has been hopped up onto B. And I can repeat this process again and again and again. So now I have a like an infinite train, which kind of says that that uh, the, it, it addresses the, uh, the, the concern of uh, flying qubit by allowing the thing to hop from one to the other. So in a form, we have formed an infinite 1D sequence of entangled light modes. So we can hop from one to the other, and we can keep doing that forever. So it's a 1D sequence of uh, light modes. But the thing to note is that, that at any point of time, only a small number of qubits are existing, coexisting. So it's not that, that all the... So you, you build the qubit that you want to hop onto and eat up the qubit that is, is already has gone to the other end of the chip or other end of the... Uh, of the line. So, uh, so effectively, this is how you can build a 1D cluster and you can actually ex extend it to 2D cluster by having other interaction. But the essence is that, that we can form an entangled state which is good for doing quantum computation by using teleportation. And the interesting thing is that, that what we have created as a cluster state is a very in highly entangled quantum state. So this is not only good for implementing qubits, but also it can be used by doing, uh, modifying and the, the state of the, 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 the measurement process and by which we can do quantum operation also during the teleportation operation. So it's not just hopping and keeping the same information we can actually do uh, operation. So this is called measurement based quantum computing. So, uh, so uh, we are coming close to the end of the talks, I think, and, and the time. So I'm, I'm going to now just uh, do a quick up, uh, wrap up of what are the things that we saw here. So uh, what we saw is that, that uh, for doing a 1D cluster state in CV, we are requiring 1D cluster state and squeeze light source, beam splitter, delay line, and homogeneous detection. These are the components. And these components are realized in different ways. You can realize them on an integrated circuit, a photon, photonic integrated circuit, or in a tabletop or fiber-based setup or in hybrid setup. So there are different ways in which we can implement this. So it is possible to extend uh, this into multiple 1D, 2D cluster state. So this is just an example of some experiments that had been done in, uh, like this is done by team of Ulrich Anderson, where uh, they have demonstrated this uh, like these are like physical components that we put together, or another example of uh, Akira Purushawa who had uh, again done it in a different configuration. Again, the idea is that, that this what we are talking about had been demonstrated in experimental setups. Okay, so of course the next set of things is that from here uh, you can and as we talked about we can take this and uh, put it into chips. We can. Uh, there are different hybrid ways of implementing this, and that's the path towards implementing a quantum computer. Okay, so uh, I would actually, this is kind of the, the point I uh, wanted to, this thing that we talked about the, uh, the basic quantum computing uh, paradigm. One is the gate-based computing, so uh, this is something that uh, Gopal talked about. 
And I quickly touched upon the fact that that when we had got gotten this this uh, entangled state, which is uh, the cluster state by the process of teleportation, the fact that that we can do measurements and by via measurement we can actually modify the state when it is hopping from one place to another. So this is that the measurement measurement based quantum computing paradigm. Uh, so it's a it the 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 the, the thought process is kind of different in the in the fact that, that we are not doing uniform unitary evolution but we are using uh, transitions and measurement to do going from one step to another hop and this is from uh, the original 2001 rosendorf's uh, uh, mbqc uh, uh, and cluster state uh, uh, introduction of that in his in his thesis and uh, and what we see is that that that, that this thing was originally proposed for matter based qubit but we can map it into a cluster state as we talked about for the photonics and use very similar concepts of measure, measurements in different uh, uh, the measurement process can be modified and that can be used to do uh, computation okay so uh, and uh, by this we have addressed both the uh, things about uh, flying qubits one is how do we ensure that once the qubit is flying off how do we ensure that it we can uh, still retain the information and the second thing is that that how do we do computation by doing appropriate measurements in the process of uh, when that teleportation is happening okay so uh, as a philosophy what happens is that, that that you ensure that when the qubits are generated upfront you ensure that all the entanglements or all their interactions are done upfront so that uh, you can later modify the content from one to the other. You can pass the information from one qubit to another qubit using measurement and teleportation. So teleportation causes it to jump from one place to another and, and tele, uh, measurement allows you to do the uh, desired operation. So uh, with that, I think uh, I would like to uh, close this talk. And uh, if there are any questions, uh, we can probably, we have probably two minutes or three minutes or maybe a minute. Uh, Great. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yes. Great. Uh, so, Mr. Uh, Priman, Gopal, and Aditi, thank you so much for your insightful uh, uh, perspectives on the quantum computing. Just wait. I think there's a echo. Just a second. Do you know? Uh, am I audible? Yes, Dr. Jain. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so I have um, questions, a, a few questions on behalf of the audience. So um, the first question is to Mr. Um, Gopal. Um, so you, you spoke about different um, approaches to quantum computing technology. So um, we spoke about uh, gate-based quantum computing. We spoke about GPS. We spoke about quantum annealing. Um, is there a specific preference in a certain context uh, in which uh, these technologies are preferred? Like, for example, gate-based quantum computing uh, would be suitable for a certain context or uh, maybe quantum annealing in a certain context. Uh, so uh, is there something like that? Uh, yeah, so so uh, as of today, so as I said, right, uh, the the quantum annealing, uh, so it implements right now, I think I didn't mention that. So I think D-Wave has a 5,000 qubit uh, uh, quantum computer, right? So with a quantum computer of that size, uh, uh, as I already said, uh, some of the combinatorial problems can already be solved and results are uh, in coherence with the, what the classical results show. So, which means with a bit more of uh, scaling and with a bit more of uh, improved quality of qubits, uh, results will start getting better than uh, classical. Okay, but that's today. But uh, if you see from a, a 
uh, richness in problem solving capability point of view that is definitely the gate based uh, i think with gate based uh, most type of problems can definitely be solved uh, but again for it to be useful uh, of course we need to move towards a fault tolerant quantum computing right it means more number of qubits better quality error correction coming in and that's when it will start uh, showing uh, useful results solving more and more problems Great. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my, my next question, in fact, the same question uh, to Mr. Biman, where, uh, where you, you very uh, beautifully explained us and how qubits are implemented. So there are different methods that you spoke about uh, for stationary qubits and flying qubits. So again, uh, in what context, uh, what would be a preferred method, method is what I really want to know. Yeah, sure. A good, very good question. So, uh, it's each of this method have their pros and cons. Okay. So, for example, if you look at superconducting qubit, uh, this is one of the things that had been shown the first. Okay. Uh, because there had been uh, research on superconducting uh, qubits, superconducting circuits, not from the context of qubits. And then you repurpose it and you can go and start building qubits around it. So, when when we are talking about a superconducting qubit, let's say that uh, the first set of uh, things in the NISC era had been very successful with that. Now, if you think about uh, trapped ion, that's an another approach which is trying to address that I don't want to cool down the system to millikelvin. So, the trade off, for example, that when you want to implement something, the, the size, the, like what, what is the hardware in which you want to invest in, what is the bottleneck or what is the, the most typical problem that you want to solve. So in case of, let's say, superconducting, the kind of problem that get easily, uh, there's the easy path to implementation, but then you have to, uh, you have to take care of uh, very low temperatures, then noise, crosstalk noise is a very big issue. So scaling up has issues there, okay? So th there is work ongoing as to how do you want to scale it from, let's say, 100 qubit to 1,000 to a million qubit. Think about the uh, aspect of uh, 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 like trapped iron or so there it is the, the 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 thing is that that once the atom is trapped they have extremely good coherence time and stability okay but in terms of interaction it is very difficult to interact and there it, you have to if you want to port if you have to do an interaction you have to go to a very very slow interaction so the speed of the computer goes down although the value can be stored very nicely okay so in terms of, let's say, the speed of computation, if you compare that to, there is a difference as a result of that. So, uh, if you think of uh, photonics, as of uh, today, there had been imp implementations where there are parts of the clusters that have been implemented, but there are more work going on in implementing more complicated states. So, each of these is right now a thing about technology and uh, their relative merits that, that are there. And none of them is like a, each of them finds usage in the niche list. It's not that, that, that one is the winner or something like that. Each of them are progressing and addressing different spaces and uh, being built. So that way it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very like a democratic way of moving forward is what I would say. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so my next question is to Aditi. Uh, sorry, there's a echo. Okay, I'm audible now. Yeah, yeah. I, no, there's some echoes. Okay, so um, uh, Aditi, uh, you you gave us a wonderful overview of what quantum computing is and uh, the business context of it. So uh, how far are we really from having a very, uh, you know, um, what you can call as a useful uh, quantum computer where, you know, useful from a business sense? So um, interesting question. Everybody wants to know when, you know, the industry really can start making some meaningful use of the quantum computing techniques. So today, um, 
there are uh, computers made by Google and IBM. They have uh, sort of some of the higher capacities. And um, there are claims that um, uh, automobile maker makers like uh, Mercedes Benz are using quantum computers made by IBM and they're using them for um, modeling some of their uh, battery related work, right? But of course, this is all very limited and it's going to be at least um, four to five years more um, as the space evolves and uh, usable, uh, adaptable quantum computers make it to the market. So we are on the right track. There are computers there. There are people who are using it. Like I said, automobile, even Volkswagen uses quantum computers for uh, some traffic optimization routing problems, right? So they are using it, but to a smaller extent and not to the full capacity. So another few years, five to six years, maybe uh, as we go along, and I think progressive milestones along the way uh, will will definitely uh, be of great value to the industry because this space in some ways is also evolving, right? We right now know a lot of these applications, how they can be used, but like I said, there are ways in which we probably cannot even think of right now in which this tech can be used. So that aspect will evolve over the next few years and um, usable quantum computers we should see uh, in the next five to six years if all the reports and all the progress uh, goes well. Great. Uh, so uh, do you see, uh, at, so, uh, do you see uh, maybe we having quantum computers on the desk the way I'm using my laptop? Is that a possibility? Not anytime soon, I think. And that is also not really a great use case for quantum computers, right? Because they are used to solve problems of a specific type. And they will always uh, be uh, in inter interfacing with a classical computer. And the way we envision it right now is um, uh, a lot of problems being solved by quantum uh, by classical computers and specific problems routed to quantum computers to solve them. So a desk kind of job for quantum computers is of no use right now. Great. Uh, in fact, you've triggered a lot of um, curiosity about quantum computers in the audience here. So this one question, which has just come up to me is, uh, can you enlist the prerequisites to understand quantum computing and quantum mechanics? And uh, how do I learn more? That's a deep, deep question. That's a very deep question because um, I don't know, there's a quote by Richard Feynman uh, from many decades back where he says that if you think you understand quantum computing, then you really do not. So, so yeah, so there's uh, jokes apart, but there's a lot of material to read. What we could probably do is, you know, um, share a few articles, a few pointers to get started. There are universities now within India uh, that have started offering uh, deeper courses on this. Right? There are uh, master's courses offering uh, specialization in quantum computing. That is one way of going about it. But um, to just get to know about the technology without really being part of these courses, a lot of material uh, available on um, uh, in the form of videos, in the form of archive papers. Uh, if you go out there and just uh, now, now, like Biman and Gopal touched upon many different aspects of quantum computing. If you just go and look up each of those concepts, you will see there's a lot of white papers. There's lots of videos explaining each of those concepts in detail. So you can either uh, do some bit of learning on your own to begin with, look at lectures online, look at white papers, or there are ways to enroll in courses uh, in universities as well. Great. Um, thank you. I'm sure this will give some direction to the audience who are curious about quantum computing uh, to proceed on their uh, journey of learning. Uh, so I, I think this is a very interesting session where we really got an overview uh, on what quantum computing is uh, in the business context. Uh, what are the different approaches to build this quantum technology and even as uh, fundamental as what is a qubit and how do you implement a qubit? Um, so uh, with this, I would uh, like to invite uh, Vardhan to uh, thank all the panel members. Thank you, sir. First of all, I would like to thank Aditi ma'am, Biman sir, and 
Kupal sir. This has been a very insight, insightful session and with certainty, I can say that all the students present here have not only learned more about the quantum computing, but also the intricacies of the quantum ecosystem. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us and we look forward to learning more from you, hopefully in person at a university. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you.